Pat, um, welcome to Around the MLS here on Africa Sports Network. Hi, Sam. How are you? I'm all right. How are you doing, sir? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, I'm so I'm so happy to have you on the show today. And um, I'm very, very honored to have um, a legend of the club on the show to talk to us about <laughs> um, his vision, his plan for this team. Well, thanks. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Um, well, oh, I don't know about a legend. You got to be careful with that one. That, those, <laughs> that's for really old people. Really old people. I'm just, I'm just kind of average, middle aged right now. I'm not quite there yet. All right, Tom. Um, what made you come back to Houston, Dan? Because I read an interview you had on one of the uh, media, and you said you waited 11 years for this job. What made you come back to Houston? To take up this position well uh i wanted to be a general manager uh so that was number one so i was definitely looking for opportunities but uh houston when i was here and from 2006 until 2010 it was a a club that um i i sort of well, let me rephrase that it was a city that i that, that i fell in love with my family did as well we had our our third child here our daughter uh abby so uh, we have a lot of connection to the city, and it's a club that when I left, uh, I always kept my eye on it. And I think part of it was had Dominic Kinnear was a coach and uh, was a good good friend of mine as well, I would I would say. So when we were playing, I kind of followed up and always made sure to see how they were doing. But uh, I was excited when the opportunity arose. Okay, your appointment kind of, you know, brought about a lot of enthusiasm, you know, among Houston Dynamo fans as um, players. Why do you think so? Um, I, I guess, as you said, maybe uh, uh, an older guy coming back to the club. Um, uh, that, that's what I hope. Uh, but what I would say is I hope they actually look at my track record. And uh, I've been very fortunate in Columbus to uh, have been a part of a couple of championship teams there. Uh, I think I think when I left, I've, I've had a lot of experiences, uh, a lot as a, as a coach. I've worked with some great coaches with Ben Olsen in D.C. and uh, Greg Berhalter in Columbus. Uh, so it's been uh, a nice little kind of – I guess along the way of getting that experience, I was a chief scout in Toronto, uh, and then I was able to be a technical director under uh, Tim Bezvichenko, who's who's got a history of success. So, uh, very fortunate, I think, to have a really a, a big wealth of experience and that has prepared me for this uh, position and this opportunity. Yeah, t talking about and uh, what has prepared you for this opportunity to come and um, I will call it a rescue mission for the team, looking at um, how the team has fared. <laughs> In the <laughs> in the last um, couple of seasons, what do you think the team need urgently at the moment? Uh, well, I think the team needs a lot of things, but uh, but first and foremost, I think if, uh, what fans and and probably what yourself or I'm going to take a guess or a little more interested in is the the player personnel on the field. Um, I think for us, uh, the the biggest thing for us is to try to go out and and try to get some attacking pieces. You know, Fafa had a great year for us. Um, you know, and we're excited to have him back, back uh, next year. So I think we need to get some support pieces for him. You know, Darwin did well at the end of the year. Darwin Quintero did, did really well when he got his opportunity late in the year to, to create some opportunities for us. So um, he is uh, somebody that we're, we're, we're discussing about a possibility of return. So uh, for us, I think we need we need probably three attacking pieces is what I see. Um, you know, Corey Baird was injured when he came in to get on the field. Tyler Pasher had some injuries. You know, Griffin Dorsey did did a good job when he got on. Um, is maybe not as an attacking piece as, as we're looking for, but certainly is a versatile piece. So I, I think for us is try to find some attacking pieces that will help us uh, uh, win some games. Yeah, talking about the attacking pieces that will help us win some games. In this um, last season, um, Dynamo did not um, win a um, road game, and which yeah. I don't see how you can, you know, want to qualify for the postseason without getting, you know, some couple of road um, wins. And when you look at some couple well, of... Well, Sam, let me, let me, hang on, let me correct you on that. Because the Columbus crew in 2010 went zero wins, five losses and five draws on the road. So they didn't win on the road and they won MLS Cup. So it's possible. It's not the easiest uh, way, way to get there. Um, and I think the reason Columbus, Columbus won the MLS Cup in 2010 is because they were phenomenal at home. At, um, yes, so, yeah. So Even I, though you I, want to I correct me on that... You got to make your yeah. home your home a fortress at least. Exactly, exactly. maximum so, points at home, and maybe yeah, whatever you I, get on the I road. Want, I, I want, I'd on. love us to be. I'd love us to get maximum points at home, but I'd also like us to win games on the road too, because I think that takes a lot of pressure off your team, knowing that if you're going to have to win 14 games at home, that's very difficult. 
Um, but if you if you can win three, four, five games on the road uh, and try to average a point per game, I think that's kind of the goal on the road. Get two points, average two points at home and and one point on the road. I think then you're you're in the playoffs. And uh, once you're in the playoffs, you're dancing. You never know what can happen. All right. In 2020 season, the year of pandemic, the team had only four home wins total. In 2021 regular season, they had only six wins in total. Mm -hmm. And they finished 21 points in 2020, and they finished 30 points this um, season that just ended. If you were in charge as of that time, what changes could you have made? Oh, uh, that's a good question. Um, but I wasn't in charge. Um, but I, I would say, you know, I, I think there's a lot of reasons why uh, the club club was there. I, um I don't have the solutions to it. I'm, I'm well. I don't. I'm hoping I have the solutions to it coming up this year, uh, but I was not involved. I don't know what the parameters were financially. I don't know what the the discussions were between Matt and the ownership group with, with the head coach. Uh, you know, with Tab. Uh, one thing I do know, uh, observing Tab and talking to people and knowing that that Tab Ramos uh, worked as hard as he he could work here. I, I, he put in a ton of hours. Uh, he wanted the club to be successful. I know uh, he was disappointed it wasn't as successful as he'd hoped, but I do know it wasn't from a lack of effort or, or a lack of trying. Um, so it's tough for me to come and judge those guys. Uh, I, I know all of them, and I know Matt very well. I know he cared about this club, um, and, and I'm sure uh, for him, he's hoping this club uh, can turn it around and be successful. All right, Tom. Um, the last GM seems um, to have his preferred market in terms of players rec recruitment. Um, where he source players, um, you are you are now in charge. How expansive will you extend your your scout now recruitment? Yeah, well, I'm not I'm not going to limit myself to a certain market. One, one thing I think it's clear. Uh, obviously, we have a, a a large Hispanic population. It would be nice to find Hispanic Hispanic players. Does that mean Spanish players? Does that mean Central American, Mexican players, South American players? Uh, I'm not very particular. Uh, to the type. I do think there are certain players, uh, profiles and countries that fit our league well. Um, the one thing I, I have discussed a little bit recently is what I would say about uh, Mexico is Mexico is now becoming attainable in our league. I, I think with the salary cap increasing, with ownership uh, revenue increasing, being willing to spend, I don't think those players, even five years ago, were realistic to come to to come to MLS. It was very difficult unless you were willing to go and get a DP. So um, now we're at the stage where some of these players will come for TAM money. They will they will take the opportunity to come play in a Houston and and play in Major League Soccer. Maybe they take a little bit less money, but to, to live in America and live in the United and United States and in Houston is something that they're excited about. So. I think that market is now opening up slowly but surely, and uh, I would love to try to find some guys from there. But at the end of the day, I think for me, uh, I'm not. That's not the only market I would look for. Uh, I'm I'm excited about trying to bring in players that will help improve our team. What about the African market, Nigeria in particular? I'm a Nigerian, you know. I want to see yeah. a, a player I can gravitate towards. Okay, I have a, a countryman playing for Dynamo, you know, which will kind of you know connect us to the club. How about that, that market? We, you look for yeah, it's funny. Yeah, Samuel, it's funny you say that because I actually <laughs> flew all the way to Casablanca to, to watch a Nigerian player uh, for Columbus. And uh, unfortunately, he didn't play in the game. So it was a long way to fly and he didn't play and we didn't end up signing him. But uh, I'm open to that. Um, I actually saw a teenage uh, uh, play um, uh, down in South Africa in a game. I was scouting a, a, one of his teammates for Zimbabwe uh, down there as well with Orlando Pirates. So I'd actually seen him play. So I'm open to any market. Uh, I'm a big believer that that any market can be successful here. I think Houston, uh, for example, and this is what you might be alluding to, is it's very hot. We know it's difficult, so it's it's tough for you know Adam Lundqvist. You have to give him credit to, to come from Sweden and to adjust, adjust to this heat is difficult for someone from Scandinavia. It's a lot probably yeah. a lot easier for someone from Africa or from Central America or Mexico or South America to be able to adjust to this weather. It's 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 a different animal this weather it's it's horrible <laughs> um but it's something what you need to use as an advantage and make it very difficult for other teams to come in here and play i remember during your unveiling i asked you a question about where you're coming from you know turnout of fans during game days and um 
just oppose it with um, PNC Stadium is almost half empty during game days. And you talk about connecting to the community. You know, yeah. do you think there's a disconnect between the team and the community? Uh, I don't, I, to be honest, I haven't been here long enough to know if there's a disconnect. I've been told enough times that there might be. Um, but what I would say is, uh, I know from a season ticket standpoint, we're, we're at about 50% of where we once were. So, um, if that's a sign of disconnect, then yes, there's a disconnect. Um, but, um, uh, so for me, uh, I think I've talked about this and gone in the past. That was one of my favorite things about playing here was my connection with the, with the fans of, of Houston, the Houston Dynamo and actually the people of Houston. Uh, we, we were, I think we were very accessible as, as players after games. Uh, one thing I always remember is our autograph alley, but we also had, there were tailgates in the parking lot. You know, there were, there were all sorts of uh, opportunities, I think, for players to connect with fans. I know in the last couple of years, I think for everybody with COVID, it's been difficult, but uh, that's something I want to, I want to bring back. I want to bring that connection to the community because I think, uh, if we don't have the support of the community, and, and that's not just the Dynamo fans. Yes, we want a packed house. Of course we would. But I think even more so, we need to be relevant in our community, in our city. Uh, and we need that support. And if we don't connect with them, then uh, shame on us for not being able to make that work. All right, then, let me talk to fans. Um, listen, this is um, the new GM of Houston, Daniel Pat Onstad. Uh, you know, even though he don't use the word legend, I see him as a legend Stop of the club. Legend. So let Stop me let me legend, tease le, le, let me tease the fans with some of you know your top saves here, so they can remember oh, no. who Pat Beautiful. is. Be easy, Kanji. Yeah, Offside, shakes loose of one defender. Kanji using his speed and those long legs on the outside, trying to battle Chabala. Shot, Kanji. Sharp angle try, and he forces Onstead to make the save. Mades now gets it to Ubi Parapovic. His shot, Onstead's got it. Johnson is down on the field one more time. He clearly can't continue. In the meantime, here's Matt Kanji bursting through. Kanji shot save made by Onstead. It's off the side of the net. Some of the fans thought it went in. Chasing the game down a man against this talented team would not be easy. Kanji, cross side. Shakes loose of one defender. Kanji using his speed and those long legs on the outside trying to battle in Chabala. Shot, Kanji! Sharp angle try, and he forces Onstead to make the save. Yeah, those are some of your, those are some of your saves. Those are some of your saves, and um, a lot of fans who have been around when you we are in the team will remember that. Can you tell us um your most memorable save that you can remember? What? Well Sam, I think that's the only game that I actually had some saves. So that, I mean, that's, uh, <laughs> and I noticed you showed one save twice. So I, I, you've been perfect for me. Would it would have given me some good film to watch? Um, yeah, there's there's some saves that stick out um, in my mind. I mean, I think there was uh, Connor Casey actually, uh, who was uh, a, a guy who coached in Colorado um, and played in the league for years. I had a penalty save where I stopped at one side and went across, and then actually blocked it with my thighs on the other side, but. That was save of the year, so I remember that. But I think for me, um, the number one save was in uh, the 2006 MLS Cup, you know, being able to stop Jay Heaps on the penalty kick. And and I've described this, but it, it's still – and I, I talk about these connections, but these were moments that that for for the rest of my life I will remember and the connection I will have with this community and this club is just being able to make that save. Unfortunately, he hit it slow enough that I could hold it. So I actually got to slide on my knees and celebrate with the fans there, but – I remember those connections, like staring at how much joy this was bringing, bringing them. I mean, I, I certainly know I had a lot of joy at the time, too. But uh, those connections are things that you don't forget as a player. Um, and, it, and I think, I'll, I'll, you know, I want to recreate those for, for, for not just for the fans, but for our players and for our staff, for them to have those moments of joy uh, and those kind of etern eternal connections that you have with the, the fans of, of Houston. And I'm, I'm really hoping uh, that we can recreate that again here. Yeah, you talk about that save. Um, that picture is very iconic. You with that, with the ball like this, slide on your knee. Yeah. Whenever you they put your name on Google, that will be the first picture that will come out. All right, talking about that. Now, the team is without a manager. You know, how expansive are you searching for Tabra Murphy's replacement? Yeah, it's that, that, that's number one, first and foremost right now. I mean, we're still in the background looking at players to try to bring in that we talked about already, but... Um, the, the, it's very important to try to get the coach in as soon as possible so he can make decisions on these players as well. Um, 
uh, my recruitment strategy is that that the player, the coach needs to be involved so that we all have ownership in the players that we bring in. So uh, the type of coach that we're looking for is a collaborative coach, a guy that wants to to work with our staff, uh, work work with our, our team, the current team that we have, and knowing that we will be adding to it. Um, but that's that's the type of person I'm looking for. Uh, a guy that drives culture, uh, winning culture, a uh, high, you know, demand, a lot of demands, attention to detail, uh, and accountability. Those, those are kind of really key phrases, key, uh, words that, are, that I'm looking for and, and the qualities in, in an individual. And then I think from a soccer standpoint, the phrase I've been using and, and is, is I'm looking for a proactive style. I want, I want to be a team that is on the front foot, a team that dictates play. Uh, I don't want to be a, a team that sits back and transitions or or counterattacks or, you know, hopes to hang in there and get a set piece goal. While I would love us to be good at set pieces, I, I still want us to be a team that can control the ball. And when we lose it, I want us to be like swarm, a swarm of bees over that thing. I, I want us to go win that thing back. I want us to be tenacious. I want us to be difficult to play against. And when people come to Houston, they know they're in for 90 hellish minutes and that they're they're not going to get out of here with any points. Yeah, talking about um, making the um, PN Stadium a fortress and the team being ruthless at home. And yep. a lot of players, um, their their contract is up at the end of this season. Um, Bonnie Garcia has entered the free market. Um, give us a little can you give us a little brief hint of players that may exit or the ones going to retain. Yeah, I don't want to give hints because we haven't spoken to all the players. Uh, I, I think in the last couple of weeks, we, you know, for, for me, I came in and basically had to make decisions in about four days on guys. So normally you'd like to have exit meetings and let them know where you stand. Uh, to be fair to the players, I think they've been excellent. I asked for a little bit of patience. Um, so I will try to get to them. The plan is to get to them this week, make a decision and let them know our decisions and where we stand. And then uh, once I speak to every player, uh, that is involved with the decision, whether it's picking up an option or declining an option, that uh, uh, then we will release it to the public. But, um, I, I, you know, the, the players, I'll, I'll give them credit. It's it's a stressful time for them. They want to know for their families, for themselves, what's going on. And, and they've been very professional, and uh, I appreciate that. I think that kind of shows the quality of individuals we have here uh, at the club. So um, I'm very grateful that, that, that they've been very understanding for me. Rather, I'm talking about the ownership, you know, how are they willing to um, um, help in terms of opening the checkbook to get players? Because when you look at the salary um, scale of all the MLS teams, Houston seems to be on the in the bottom side, and you need money to run to run club. You need money to get in players, even though yes, buying buying players expensive doesn't guarantee success, but at least you know you need some kind of fund to make that happen. How willing is that Sego in opening up the checkbook? Yeah, I think that's a great question, Sam. I, I, and I, yes, in the league, generally speaking, when you spend more money, you tend to have more success. Uh, the irony is this year, actually, the highest spending teams, Toronto's, Atlanta's, have actually been, uh, well, Atlanta's in, but it, it, it have struggled a little bit. So um, generally speaking, though, the, the high spenders, you know, the LAFCs, the LA Galaxies, they haven't made it in. But generally speaking, those are teams that, that do get in and, and are playing at this stage of the season. So uh, what I would say with with uh, with Ted Siegel is he's willing to invest uh, certainly a lot more than in the past. I don't think he's willing to uh, at this stage until we get to a point where he's comfortable uh, opening up a checkbook and just saying, OK, go go like Atlanta and spend, you know, 19 million on on a, on a player and stuff like that. And I'm not comfortable at this point uh, because I don't think our team is ready for that. But what I will say is we will we will. Uh, we, we will be definitely in the top half, hopefully the top third of spenders in the league, which to me uh, gives you an excellent opportunity to, to win championships uh, and compete. Uh, and that that's where we're at. And I think uh, the beauty of um, uh, Ted Siegel is that he's he's willing to listen and uh, and help the club can be successful. So the biggest thing for us is to make sure that we we get to a point where we're very competitive and we know that we're a playoff team. And then I think at that stage, uh, as an ownership group, as a soccer operations department, as a head coach, we will sit down and uh, try to push. But but there's a lot more money available than there was in the past. All right. Um, fans um, will be very happy to hear that there's a lot of money available 
to spend on players. I'm not going to take much of a time in part because I know you're a busy man. You have a lot of stuff to do. So what message do you have for fans, some of them who are sitting ticket holders who say, you know what, I'm not going to come to stadium or those who say, you know what, I'm not going to come until the team start to win. What message do you have for them that this is a new dispensation? Well, it's tough to get them in the stadium to saying if we're going to, we have to win. We haven't played a game yet. So uh, I'm hoping maybe for the home opener, they might just take a chance and, and see where see where we're at. But I would also say, and I've said this before, is is judge us by what we do and and not what we say. So, um, you know, ho hopefully by the time we start the season, there will be, you know, I'm hoping for three p three attacking pieces, but that that may take a little bit of time in the beginning of the season. But um, if we don't have two attacking police, uh, pieces in place, you know, that's shame shame on me for not being able to get that across the line, and and it certainly won't be from a lack of effort. Uh, but I'm pretty confident that we we can go and get those players uh, that will help us uh, compete. Um, so so I I would I would expect to see some attacking pieces that'll change and that hopefully give us some some blood. And then also we're going to need a few depth pieces as well. So there will be some changes. Um, and then the other piece I would say is hopefully the the head coach decision, which will uh, is still a lot. We're just at the beginning stages, but we're excited about the the candidates that we have. Uh, and the people that we're, we're about to start talking to. So uh, I'm, I'm excited about that. I think some of the fans will be uh, really excited about the, the names that will start coming out. Okay. Can, can you give us hints here? Can I be the first to know the names? I know. <laughs> I, I'm going to be a little careful in the names right now. But I think, um, unfortunately, it's a soccer business. Uh, you know as well as anybody, it's it's pretty small business. And uh, I think once you start talking to people, names start start leaking out pretty quickly. So uh, we're excited about the guys we have uh, that were that, that are uh, potential candidates and and guys that we're hoping will uh, will jump at the opportunity. And the irony is, uh, it's a club that a lot of people have thrown their names in the hat and are very excited about about a chance to to interview for the position. So uh, we're we're excited moving forward with this process. Paul Douglas just left Inter uh, Miami FC. Is he in in consideration for the job? Uh, I, I know Paul very well. Um, I think he's uh, uh, done a good job down there in Miami, and I think he's he's kind of bounced around a bit. But everywhere he's gone, he's been pretty successful. So um, he's a guy we've spoken to. Or he's you know he and I have, have spoken, or at least c contacted via text actually. Um, but um, I, at this stage, I don't want to bring names into it. Uh, and got you, I think got we'll just kind of leave it at that. Got you, Pat. All right, Pat. I'm yeah. gonna let you go right now. I appreciate you for taking out this time to speak to me on the show today uh, anytime sam anytime I, I appreciate your support and uh thank you for supporting the dynamo and also more importantly thank you for supporting soccer we're still trying to grow this game and and make more people uh love it fall in love with it so thanks for all your support yeah here on africa sports network we are still open if the team wants us to be that bridge between them and the nigerian community you know we're here to support it is our home team that's why we're here thank you Pat. i appreciate that thanks sam all right, have a nice day. You too. All right, and that's Pat Onstead, um, the new GM of Houston Dynamo, as he spoke to us on the way forward for the team. This is Around the Major League Soccer on Africa Sports Network. And my name is Sam. Thank you for joining me on the show. Next time will be another another um, star on the show. Thank you. And don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel, Africa Sports Network, Africa with a K, Sports Rezi. Until we see you again, adios. <laughs>